I'm kind of a novice with techno stuff, so that's all right, though. Well, good morning to everyone. It's good to be here with you this morning. I would like to share first two items. First, while we're Eric and Amy Fields, and our son Andrew is with us this morning, uh, if you see on the back of the bulletin, there's a picture of our family. Our son Scott is not with us right now. Um, he's uh, going to be a junior in college. He's in eastern Texas right now at a Christian camp called Pine Cove. He's working there as a counselor this summer. So kids grow up and go away, and that's a good thing, I guess. So um, We would like to tell you, though, first, before we get started, thank you so much for being supporters of ours. Uh, supporters in prayer and in finances, being our friends when we're overseas. We, we really, really appreciate the friendship that we have and the partnership that we have with you in our work in Bible translation. Um, we literally could not do what we're doing without you, so thank you very much. We also want to thank you for a chance to share this morning, too. Um, I was mentioning just this morning. We've been sharing for the last five weeks or so in different churches throughout California and Arizona as well. Um, you're getting us at the end of the trip, so hopefully we've got our act cleaned up now, and this will work out really well. Um, let me read. If you do have your bulletin, I want to read the passage there. Um, this is a passage. It won't be too apparent as I begin, but by the time we're done, hopefully this passage will make sense why this is the one we're sharing with you this morning. I'll go ahead and read that. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people. For not everyone has faith, but the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Amen. Okay, I would like to start this morning giving you a brief timeline or a history of Amy and, and my life or ministry together. Um, I'm going to try to be brief, but, but if I don't do this, then it really won't make sense what our ministry is all about and what we're doing right now. So if you understand this part, I, th I think that would be the most helpful. Again, I'll try to be brief. I'll skip the the nitty-gritty. Um, Amy, Amy went to Biola in Southern California, and I went to Long Beach State. And we got married in 1992 and decided to pursue missions together with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and that's who we're with now. Um, Wycliffe's an organization that does Bible translation around the world, um, it mostly in minority groups. Uh, we generally don't do the major languages of the world because they have Bibles already. So that's not really the concern of Wycliffe. And we're working, I will mention to you now, um, in a country, uh, Niger, West Africa. Um, but recently our project has been classified as a sensitive project, which means that we're not supposed to share with people anymore where we work or who the people are. Um, again, by the time we get done this morning, all that will make sense a little bit more. Well, we were married in 1992, and we went overseas in 1994 to pursue our first uh, uh, study together, which was French studies in, in France. We ended up in Switzerland, uh, where they also speak French. And then we arrived in Niger, our, the country we were assigned to, in 1995. Um, what most missionaries do with Wycliffe when they arrive on the scene is uh, some kind of group service. So the problem is you arrive in another country and you don't really know the country, you don't know how to function in the country, you don't know uh, how other people function in the country or really what your role should be within the organization. So the first year there, uh, Amy and I ran the, the Wycliffe, the SIL Center in the capital city, Niamey. Uh, Amy ran the guest house and I was the finance manager for a year as we continued to work on our French and, and tried to decide at that time what language group we would work with in translation. So it really wasn't until 1996 that we started working among the Manga people. That's the group of people that we work with, and now I won't mention that name anymore. Um, our first son was born in um, 1995, Scott. 
Uh, Andrew was born in 1997. Um, we continued to do language learning, but found out in around 1999 that Andrew had some hearing problems. Um, if you've seen him today, he wears cochlear implants. Uh, he's doing great, but he's a large part of our story. Um, in 1999, his hearing loss was, there are four levels of hearing loss. You can have a, a mild, uh, I guess a moderate, uh, severe, mild, moderate, severe, or profound. And he was right in the middle, um, moderate to severe. I do know this. I'm just trying to get it straight in my mind. Um, the problem at the time, though, uh, we were told uh, with his kind of hearing loss, with hearing aids, he would be able to make progress and to be oral. Uh, he would be able to learn to speak normally. And so we decided to continue with our mission work. And Andrew was fitted with hearing aids, and we started to do that. Um, this was about in the year 1999, 2000, right in there. And we were still doing language learning, just finishing up, learning manga, ready to go with all that. Well, one of the problems in this whole story is that Niger, if you know anything about it, is in West Africa, south of the Sahara Desert, where there's a lot of dust, where it's really hot, and it's very humid. And those are probably the three worst things for hearing aids. Um, they would get dusty all the time. They would get uh, kind of corroded. Uh, we'd have to clean them out. They, we would need to ship them back to the US. And we had a second pair. And then those he would have problems with. And it didn't really work as well as you might like it to. Um, we passed our language test in 2000. I can tell you about that another time. Um, how you take a language test in a language that the person testing you doesn't speak is kind of interesting, but there it is. The reason we have to pass a language test, though, is so that we can be cleared to do translation work. They want to make sure that we can communicate on a basic level and we're not trying to fool anybody about what we're doing. Um, right when we pass the language test, though, as God's providence would have it, um, I was asked to be the director in Niger, which meant we couldn't continue with our translation work, but we needed to fill in as director for a period of about a year. Another director was coming, but they needed an interim person there. So we agreed to do that. Um, Andrew at this time ended up having a few um, ear infections. Um, one of the problems with wearing hearing aids is they keep your ears plugged up all the time, and so with the humidity and things like that, he ended up with a number of ear infections. Well, we came back to the U.S. in 2002 thinking, gosh, you know, it, this has taken a long time to learn the language, to get settled in. Andrew's having these struggles. You know, what does all this mean? Well, when we were back in the U.S. at that time, Andrew's ears cleared up amazingly well. He was doing so great. Uh, he had some tubes put in his ears, as a lot of little kids do. Um, his ears, as I said, they cleared up, they healed. He was perfect. This, everything was starting to look really good. Of course, where were we at, though? In nice, clean California, where you could take care of things like that. So we went back overseas in 2003 for our third term, ready to do translation work, where we're just itching to go. And we get back, and within a month of being there, Andrew had another ear infection. So we wrote an email at the time, email is a wonderful thing, uh, to our family doctor in Southern California, and we said to him, you know, you'd given us, on our furlough time, you'd given us some antibiotic drops for Andrew's ears. Those, those are all gone now, but we really, really like them. Can you send us some more of these antibiotic drops? And he wrote back and said, I don't think you should be living in Niger anymore. And, and that, was, that was a big blow to us. I mean, for one, that wasn't our question. So we're thinking, OK, what do we do with this? Um, but what he was saying was very, very sobering. You know, God gives us our children. They're, they're a gift from the Lord. And as much as we wanted to be in Niger, and both Amy and I felt called to this work, we both felt like 
God was speaking through our doctor saying, you know, you need to take care of your son. You need to make sure he gets the help he needs. Not only is he struggling with his ears and the ear infections, but he needs to learn to speak well too. And Niger wasn't the easiest place to do that. So at the suggestion of some friends, uh, some colleagues who had done this very thing, they suggested that we return to the US, find a good place to live and work on translation work remotely. Um, at the time, that kind of scared us. We thought, work remotely, do a translation project while living in the US. And they said, well, yeah, here's what you do. You know, you get set up a good base somewhere in the US, live inexpensively, but then make trips. Just use email, send work back and forth to colleagues. Um, if you, and again, the reason why this worked is we had all these relationships in place. We had uh, our manga friends who were working with us who were willing to do translation work this way. We had colleagues who could work the email and send stuff, print stuff out and, and help us in that way. And so we thought, okay, you know, if this is what the Lord's doing in our lives, we, you know, we wanna honor what he's doing, we're ready to do it. So we moved to Dallas, Texas. Um, the reason we picked Dallas is that's one of three places where Wycliffe has headquarters in the U.S., and that's where they do all their linguistics training. So we thought, okay, why don't we go live there? By the way, it's a little less expensive to live in Texas, if you haven't heard. So that worked out well, too. But no kidding. I mean, you're, you're hearing this story up to this point and the struggles that we had getting started we start translation work in 2004, and by 2007, we had finished translating Luke and Acts, and that's a quarter of the New Testament. So, so when the Lord wants us to do something and things aren't working out, you know, it's not that we throw our hands up and say, I guess this isn't going to work, but sometimes the Lord knows <laughs> what he's doing. I shouldn't say it that way, should I? The Lord knows what he's doing all the time. It's, it's us that slowly get informed to understand what his plans are. So by 2007, we had finished Luke and Acts, and somebody got, got us turned on to the idea that uh, we could dub the translation of Luke uh, into manga for the Jesus film. It's Campus Crusade who has the Jesus film, and they do this regularly in different languages where translations work's going on, it's based entirely on the book of Luke, so if a team has done that work, they just need to prepare the script and get it ready, get the people together to record it. So we thought, okay, that would be a good idea. The, the manga are not highly literate, so having scripture in a film like that is a great way to present it. So by 2009, a couple years later, we worked on the film, had it done, and somebody came up with this wild idea of showing the Jesus film on national TV in Niger, uh, which is a bit crazy because Niger is a Muslim country. So why would they want to do this? Well, they wanted to do it because it was Easter Sunday, and they thought, well, we'll show this manga film, the Jesus film, on national TV. So we're thinking, wow, this is, this is pretty neat because we're looking for all these ways to evangelize, ways that we can share that's relevant to people and the government's wanting to show the film on national TV. So we're thinking, okay, go ahead, do that. That, that would be good. Um, part of our problem, though, in doing the Jesus film is that the Manga people are 99.9% are .9 Muslim. And they have a problem um, with a number of things Christian. And so we were told before we did this that there may be people who would refuse to be in the film, you know, to allow their voices to be in the film because they don't want to be recognized as participating with the Christians to help a Christian cause. And we thought about that and we thought, well, you know, it seems like people are pretty open about it though. We, we understand the concern, but if we find the people and, and tell them plainly, you know, here's what you're getting involved with, are you okay doing this? And, People seemed all right about it. Well, they showed it on national TV, and rather than having people that were upset about it, everybody was thrilled. And all these 
these, these Muslims, I, I kid you not, they hadn't become Christians, but they were so excited that there was a film that they were calling each other on their cell phones saying, did you see that? There was this manga film on TV. No way. And they were saying who was in the film, and everybody was excited. Uh, there was one guy, one story we like a lot. Uh, we had dubbed a number of um, copies, DVD copies, thousands of copies just to give out. And there was a taxi driver who was in the film, and we ran out of copies, and he's a Muslim, and he said, well, is it okay if I just take my money and buy blank DVDs and make my own copies to give out to people? We're thinking, well, you know, that's not really the strategy for evangelism, that you'd have people just go do this, but if you want to, that'd be great. And that's what he did. Um, right after we did the, the Jesus film, though, we started to find something out that we hadn't been aware of up till this point. And that's that um, people who come from a Muslim background, I, I, we knew the truth of this, we just, it just hadn't hit home to us. Uh, people from a Muslim background have the tendency to be very literal in their understanding of uh, translation and scriptures and how they think scripture should be translated. I'll explain a little bit of that later. Um, but at that time, they were wanting the Christians who we were working with, and there were only about a dozen Christians at this time, they were really wanting our translation work to be more literal based. Uh, up till that point, we had done uh, the Jesus film in a more uh, dynamic approach, kind of uh, NIV-ish or New Living Translation, kind of that level, so that anyone who heard the gospel, who heard scripture for the first time, would be able to hear it clearly. You know, we didn't want it to sound wooden to them or to be very difficult to digest. Um, but again, the Christians, after the films were coming out, they were starting to question these things. What I'd like to do is just stop right there for a minute, because I, I kind of brought you up to the present. What we'll do is show a, a PowerPoint that'll just give some pictures of people and kind of fill in some gaps. And then when we come back, we'll talk about some translation issues. Um, one caveat about the PowerPoint, though, um, this PowerPoint was done at home by missionaries, so it's not high quality. Uh, it will tell the story really great, um, but there are some sound levels in it that aren't just right, and we know that, so we're sorry for that. Oh, there's no sound. Okay. What's it under a bed? Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed, and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. Eric and Amy Field, Scott and Andrew, missionaries to the Manga people since 1996. Serving in Bible translation, scripture in use. Currently working from the U.S. as a remote assignment, Eric takes annual work trips to Niger. We hope to return to live in Niger in a few years. We plan to publish the four Gospels
and for the evangelists and new believers too. Isa e fu ranjuro. Come on tum droni, bichi dia de lenga na droni, kam fatla juosi. Wasia am fadro nga saivi, nurda tororo, dia fatla gnadro ma daman gnaji. Oro audo on kama graga, fu un federo chuli wa falma pao. Aofia eno do bara ala ujina. Kermano zin nizua ala fuon isanoji. To, jili mana ni fanu yuro angal genano. Kam kawili ngila rongoji na madi, ala il munji chirai. Ama kam kawili ngoji nidi, ala il munji chirai na tamajina adama nanjun chumoi. Okay, um, so many things to talk about. A by the way, Amy's going to speak at the end to kind of talk about some of the ministry issues. What I would like to talk about right now, though, are some translation issues that we've faced over the years, especially this idea of working with Christians who desire to have a more literal translation. That's kind of what I'm going to explain here. In the world of translation, we talk about Bibles as being translated in one of a number of different ways. If you think of a, a scale here in front of you, and I'll do this toward you, but on this side we have literal translations like the NASB or the New King James or the ESV. And then if you move down the scale, we have modified literal or moderately literal translations like the NIV. Um, it's also a literal translation, but it's more thought for thought, which is a little bit different than a strictly literal translation. Then you move down farther this way and you come to dynamic translations. This would be something like the New Living Translation, uh, the Good News Bible, or today's English version. And the goal with those translations is to speak well in English. It's not that they don't want to be accurate, it's just that they want the English to be good. So that's their focus. And then you keep going a little bit farther and you end up on this end where there are free translations is what we call them. And that would be something like the message. Um, in the world of Wycliffe, they, they like us to be somewhere in the middle. Um, something that's too free, like the message, doesn't work out well because then people claim that you're corrupting scripture. You're putting things in that aren't really there. Um, but if it's too literal, that can be a problem too, especially for a people group where they don't have a church background. Uh, for Muslims who don't know what scripture teaches, something that's overly literal can actually be a problem for them. As I mentioned before in our translation project, what we were doing was more or less a dynamic translation, something like the NIV, but really like the, the New Living Translation. Um, and the idea was, because the people are illiterate, we wanted to focus on the manga being good manga that they could understand, and somebody who was not a Christian could hear the message and understand the words right away. Um, since we were doing the Jesus film, this was a lot of people considered to be the, the preferred way to do it, so that the actors that were speaking and when they dubbed the film, it was like they were speaking manga. They weren't speaking a foreign language. They weren't speaking a foreign language translated. It just sounded like good manga. But as I've mentioned, with the addition of many Christians now to the mix, it became apparent to us that they desired a more literal translation style where they could see the equivalencies more readily. Um, the real problem then is how in translation do you make adjustments? Um, I prefer the word adjustment. You make an adjustment so that when somebody hears scripture, they are understanding it the way it, it should be understood. Again, the, the problem from a Muslim direction is that Christians corrupt scripture when they translate it. If you didn't know this, Muslims, their, their holy book is called the Quran, 
and they don't translate the Quran. The Quran is in Arabic. If you've ever seen the Quran in English or French or anything like that, that's not an authorized translation. They don't allow for that. Um, again, they think Christians, when we do translations in different languages, they say we're corrupting scripture. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean by making adjustments as opposed to corrupting scripture. Amy, when she studied French, she actually studied French before I did. And when she was in French study, she was talking to a friend of hers and wanted to mention to her that she was going to take a nap. So she said to her friend, in French, the equivalent of take a nap, and her friend laughed and said, oh, Amy, oh, no, take is like this. And, in, and so Amy's thinking to herself, well, that's what we say in English, take a nap. And, and this lady told her, no, in French, you say make a nap. Now you think about that and you think, well, that doesn't make sense because make is putting something, how can, it, how can you make a nap? If any of you here speak another language fluently, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There are many adjustments that we make between languages because that's just how we say it. In English, we say take a nap, even though the word take is like this, the phrase take a nap means to lay down and go to sleep. That's, the words don't always mean exactly what together the words mean. Okay. So again, that I would call that a necessary adjustment. That's not a corruption. It's an adjustment that we make so that we communicate accurately. Here's an example from Luke 1.24, exactly like the take a nap example. In scripture in Luke 1.24, it says, after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. Now, in some of our translations, this is the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Some of our translations say, after these days, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. Okay, the Greek word is conceived but we have translations that say became pregnant. And that's acceptable to us because that's what conceived means. And we probably would say became pregnant. Well, in manga, when we translated it, they said right away, churo ngoyeno, which means that she took stomach. And now you think about this and you say, oh, so they say she took stomach. Now, if I were to say to them, oh, should we say that she became pregnant in some other way, they would say, oh, no, 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 because we say she took stomach. And to them, that is the right adjustment to make for this idea. Now, is that a corruption? <laughs> have we corrupted scripture or have we adjusted it so that it says the same thing in their language, even though we say took stomach. Well, these examples that I've given you so far just involve idioms or collocations, the way words come together and then kind of mean something other than what the two words or three words mean separately. But the real problem in translation is that this doesn't just happen with idioms. This happens everywhere. <laughs> Um, if you think about language in your times in, a, in an English class and you're learning about all these parts of speech and you have, you know, connectors between sentences and you have nouns and you have verbs and you have articles, you have pronouns and you have possessive pronouns and you have adjectives and you have verb tenses and you have gerunds and the list is long. Well, the problem is manga does not match up with Greek pretty much in every category. So it's not just on the level of words, it, it's everywhere. Uh, here's an example with pronouns. You know, we have, you mentioned pronouns this morning. Uh, I don't know if that was in here or in the Sunday school. Uh -huh, and you mentioned you and your second person pronoun. Well, in third person, English and Greek match up very well. You have he, she, and it. You have it in Greek. You have it in English. 
translator's best friend. That's great. Whatever they do in Greek, you can do in English. It works great. In manga, they have one pronoun for third person singular. It can be he, it can be she, it can be it. So you have a story with Jesus meeting some woman, and then in, in Greek they say she did something. You cannot say that in manga because then you don't know who it's talking about. So you end up having to do some strategy. What usually happens is Jesus, because of who he is, gets the pronoun, and then the woman is called the woman throughout the story. Again, this isn't a corruption. This is an adjustment that we make so that Scripture speaks clearly and they know who's being talked about when they hear it. Uh, if you look through different translations on this level, you'll find out that English will adjust these things sometimes too. Um, there will be Jesus with maybe one other male person, and some translations will just stick with a pronoun, and others that are a little bit more dynamic will say, and the man, and then you'll know it's not Jesus, or it'll say, then Jesus did something, but you go back and look at Greek, and it doesn't have the name there. It might just be the pronoun, and again, these are just adjustments to avoid miscomprehension or misunderstanding. Let me give you another example on this note. Um, in Luke 3.11, John the Baptist is talking to the people who come to him and ask him what they should do. You know, he's telling them to repent of their sins, um, that the, the Holy One of God is coming. And they say, what should we do then? What should we do? And he answers and says, whoever has two tunics or two shirts must share with the one who has none. Well, we're translating that phrase in manga, and it comes out like this. Kam nanjun gamaji yin diadu. That doesn't sound funny to you. Which means the man in his place with two shirts. Now, manga is funny this way because when you express possession, they use possessive pronouns. In English, if you notice, the verb is has. The whoever has two shirts should share with the one who has none. Well, manga, they don't like that verb has. They just say the man in his place with two shirts. Again, is that a corruption or is that a necessary adjustment so that it sounds manga to them? That's, again, the issue. And, and if you sit with somebody who's a Muslim who claims you're, you're corrupting scripture, the argument back is, no, no, we're not corrupting it. We're trying to communicate the same thing, but in manga. We're, this isn't Greek. This isn't English. This isn't French. This is manga, and this is how you say it in manga. And again, it happens everywhere. Uh, every level of connector, verb, verb tense has struggles like these. Well, one last thing I would like to mention about this is that the problems really go further than this. You know, I could say to you that, that it happens everywhere, but, but it's, it's not just a linguistic problem. The problem also involves culture, it involves context, and it involves theological ideas that people may not have. And so it's not so simple just to adjust something so that people can understand it. Sometimes even the best adjustments don't work. Um, here's an example of that. In Luke 18, 24, Jesus is talking about entering the kingdom of God. Um, this is a particular problem for manga people for a number of reasons. Uh, the first problem is the, the manga don't have a good word for kingdom. So now you start thinking about this, okay, they don't, you know, John the Baptist and Jesus are talking about the nearness of the kingdom of God, they're preaching the kingdom of God, and now Jesus is saying, whoever wants to enter into the kingdom of God, and the manga don't have a word for this. So, you know, you start digging around and they start talking about, well, you know, you can say region, you know, is there a region of God or a country of God, and you think, well... You know, kingdom of God really isn't a location 
That's the problem. If you, if you get into commentaries or what pastors might say, I think you even said this this morning, it's, it's the reign or the rule of God. God rules in our hearts. That's the idea behind kingdom. You know, when the kingdom comes, he comes to, to rule within us. So some of the translation helps say, if you don't have a word for kingdom, try God's rule or God's holy or God's blessed rule. And so we tried that. And people would say, yeah, that works great. God rules us. So, so it's God's rule or holy rule in our lives. Well, now here's the second problem is when you put that with the verb to enter. You enter into God's blessed rule. And then they say, no, 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 no. You, you can't say that in manga. And we think, sure, I just put those words together. What do you mean? <laughs> and they say, no, you, you can't do that because, um, and they couldn't express this exactly. Um, in manga, you can't enter into an abstract concept. You enter into things like buildings. You enter into cars. You can enter into a lake. You can't enter into a relationship. That's not what the word enters for. Now, now you start thinking about this, and the manga people have a problem with words like pour. You pour liquids. But Paul says he pours out his life. OK. <laughs> That, that doesn't work so good. And then fill. This is a bad one, too. You know, you fill things up. You fill up containers. This is what manga people do with fill. Everyday life, you fill things. You cannot fill up to the full measure of one's sins. That, I mean, these, these are theological ideas that you can say them in manga, but they don't compute with the way they speak. So. With our translation strategy, what we do is we try to make all these adjustments, but we, you come to that point where there's theology involved, and in the end you just say, okay, we'll translate it that way, and we understand that you're having a difficulty with what this means exactly, but we're not going to change the translation. We're going to say, enter in to the blessed rule of God, but then we're going to put a note over to the side that explains what that means. Because we don't want to corrupt scripture. We have to make adjustments. We have to, we have to, we have to. But if they don't understand something, then at some point we just have to put a note and, and just truly pray. You know, we pray that God's word comes to the manga people so that his Holy Spirit is ministering to their hearts. It's not just our words that we're figuring out the best words. We want His Spirit to speak through His Word to touch their hearts. So we try to make use of things like notes and summaries and things like that. And in the end, I think that's the best for the manga people. I mentioned before that our strategy had been more dynamic. We're, we're at a point right now where we're wanting to print scripture in this next year. We want to print the four gospels. Uh, Muslims call the four gospels the Injil. Uh, it's the life of Jesus. We want to print that in, in a Roman script and in an Arabic script so that the people can have it to read and it will be in this more um, modified literal style so that the Christians will be able to defend the translation before their, their Muslim uh, brothers and sisters. I'd like Amy to come up now. She's going to share some things about um, manga ministry kind of as it goes farther beyond just us. I don't know. We're really excited to be able to be with you this morning because just really a lot of exciting things are going on um, in ministry to the manga people right now. And so we're really glad to be able to bring you a report about that. So Eric mentioned when he was speaking about the fact that our uh, administration has classified our language project as sensitive and asked us to no longer use the name of the language or the people that we work with in our publications and our, in our communication. And um, a lot of that is due to what's been going on in northern Nigeria. 
and uh, where we lived in Maini Soroa was only three kilometers from the border with Nigeria. And until just a few months ago, most people weren't really very aware of what was going on there. But uh, there's a sect called Boko Haram that a lot of people have become aware of now recently. And they were in existence even when we were living in, in Niger 10 years ago, but they were just a fundamentalist sect. The women would dress a little bit more traditionally when their family decided to uh, follow along with that sect. And, um, but about five years ago, they started to become much more violent. They would like to see a part of northern Nigeria um, become a, a fundamentalist Islamic state and pull away from the country of Nigeria and follow Sharia law. And so as a result, they've been attacking anything to do with any, anything Western. It's not just churches, although though they have attacked churches, they've also attacked schools. As you know, they've abduct, abducted schoolgirls. Um, they've attacked villages. They've attacked even mosques if the Muslim cleric has spoken out against them and said that they are not a good way to go. Um, so basically anything that they can, uh, soft targets. They've um, killed probably about 10,000 people in the past five years. And so with that, just right across the border from us, we've uh, been concerned for the believers. And um, that's why our administration has asked us to try to just be a little bit more careful in the way that we communicate. The amazing thing is, while that's been going on, you would expect people to be more nervous about trying to find out about the gospel. But instead, just the opposite has happened. In the past three years, we've seen just amazing things happening. A lot of that's been due to the Jesus film uh, being, becoming available. And then also, we work with two just really wonderful guys. One is um, a trained pastor. The other is an evangelist. Prior to going to Bible school, he had only a sixth grade education. But both of them are just tremendous men of God, and you, they're almost like guys out of the book of Acts, just willing to go anywhere and, you know, speak to anybody, and they've been taking all of these materials that we've been providing for them and going all over and uh, doing evangelism and outreach, and it's just really, really been amazing. So uh, I would like to share with you three excerpts from a recent uh, update that we had. The first one is regarding a church building. The believers in this one village had been meeting out in the open and uh, we were a little bit concerned for them. If they have a church building, the government usually will give them land to build a church building and then they receive some measure of security and protection. The government's willing to protect them. And so um, some colleagues of ours in England had raised money to have a church building built. And so this is the account of what happened when they went out to start working on the church building. The trip started well with Pastor Modu and Isa spending a few days with the community of believers in the village of Z. The first night they showed the Acts film in manga, the second night they taught the brothers, the third night they showed the Magdalena film, and the fourth night they did more teaching. The next day they all started working on the construction of a meeting place in the village and that night the, the Jesus film was shown. Then the village chief suggested that it would be more appropriate for the believers to construct a building in village B, the district capital, first of all, before constructing one in Z. He felt that the district chief would not look favorably on him if Z had a church building before the capital of the district. Practically speaking, this meant halting the construction work in Z and diverting the resources giving, given for the church building to the district capital instead. The brothers in Z weren't at all pleased at this unexpected turn of events, but going against their chief's advice would not be wise or culturally appropriate. Pastor Modu and Isa encouraged the believers as they faced up to this blow to their hopes and plans. Graciously, the group promised to help with the construction of a building in B as soon as land could be found there. Pastor Modu and Isa immediately went to B, where the district chief confirmed that constructing a church building in B first was the right way forward, and he ensured a suitable plot of land was allocated for them to buy. Within two weeks, a team of people, including some from Z, were helping to make mud bricks needed in the construction work. So the amazing thing is, here you've got this group of believers hoping for a church, and then this other village that has 
I, th I think a few believers, but maybe not quite as many, says, hey, we're the district capital. We should get a church first. And so now the church is being built there. Later on, a church will be built in the other place as well. But it's just really exciting to see how God is working, even in unexpected ways through, through cultural means, to, to grow his kingdom. These people are, are having the opportunity to go help build a church building in this other village. And I'm sure sharing with the people there about what it means to have a church there in their village. And so um, we're excited to see what God's going to do in both of those places. All right. And then this next excerpt is regarding a discipleship trip that they took. So Pastor Modu and Isa were able to meet with the believers in S. This is now a third village who had been experiencing opposition. They encouraged those who had remained strong in their faith and those who had been afraid. There were also some new people who had joined their group. They all urged Pastor Modu and Isa to come back and stay overnight so that they could talk together for a much longer time. The village chief was friendly and very pleased to receive some manga DVDs as well as a replacement MP3 radio for his old one which had died. The men also revisited the village A, so that's now the fourth village that we've talked about, where a group of men who had been really interested in the gospel had been facing opposition. Ten of them were present at the meeting, but this was disrupted by some people opposed to the message, and again, no call to com commitment could be made. And then the last um, excerpt that I'm going to read is about an evangelism trip about an even another village that they went to, and it's, it's really quite touching. It reads very much like the Book of Acts. Here, in Pastor Madhu's words, is an account of a visit to a new village. We also went to a village at the invitation of the local teacher and showed the Magdalena film, which was watched by many, men, many women and some men. After the film, the chief came and said to us that the elders of the village did not, want to, uh, did not want to hear any more. So we replied, if you do not want more, we will stop. But those who had seen the film did not want us to leave. Even when some people tried to chase them away from us, they refused to leave. We could see that they were thirsty for the gospel. We encouraged the teacher and all who were there. We said, one day things will work out for you. Today they haven't, but one day they will. If the elders of your village don't want the gospel, don't be discouraged. We are with you, and there are believers in B and Z who can be in contact with you any time. We prayed and continued on our way. There were three villages where they were able to show the Magdalena film to a large number of people and where the response was very positive. In one village, the chief, his wives, and some religious teachers came to see the film. Three people gave their lives to the Lord that night, and the chief received an MP3 radio so that he and the elders could listen to the scripture recordings. In another village, eight people believed. Once again, the chief was very friendly, and the religious teacher said to Pastor Modu and Isa that their message was very clear, adding, who can get to paradise without forgiveness? In the third village, after watching the film, a group of seven men said that they would come later to visit Pastor Madhu and Isa. So this is why we are involved in translating, in translation, so that we can provide these men with the materials that they need to go out and do these kinds of outreaches. And it's just really, really exciting to see what God's doing through them. And as Eric mentioned, we're hoping to publish the Gospels um, next year a booklet that will contain the four Gospels together. And he mentioned that we would like to do it in both Roman and Arabic script. And that's a little bit confusing because Arabic is both a language and a script. So Roman script, which is what we use when we write English, can be used to write not just English but many different languages. It can be used to write Spanish or French or Italian, German. And Arabic script is the same. It's being used around the world to write a lot of different languages in, in Muslim countries. And so it can be used to write manga as well. The thing that's really interesting is many people learn Arabic in order to read the Quran, but they never learn to speak Arabic. So they're essentially reading a, a script that they don't even understand the language. They may understand just a few words, but other than that, they don't understand anything else. If we now take Arabic script and use it to write their own language, the results are amazing because they can actually understand what they're reading for the first time with minimal training. And we've, we've heard stories of people being asked to test booklets, and when they start reading it and really realize that they can actually understand what they're reading for the first time, they won't give it back. 
which is exactly what we want with scripture. We want people to be so excited that they you know, want to just keep reading and reading. And that is really the power of using these people's own language. That's why the Jesus film has been so well received. That's why these scripture portions are being listened to even by religious teachers, by village chiefs, because they don't have anything else in their own language. They don't have the huge amount of media that we have available in English. They have nothing in their own language. And they want to know about Jesus. They want to know about the prophets. And so they're very, very open to religious teaching. And when we use the Arabic script, that also provides a lot of legitimacy for it because all of their religious teaching is done in Arabic. So when they see something in Arabic script, they automatically trust it. It takes away all the suspicion and they're, wet, they're ready to read it and, and hear what it has to say. So we're, we're really excited about what it's gonna do to, to get things in uh, Roman script, Arabic script, and then also we hope to get things in oral form as well. We hope to get eventually the entire New Testament recorded um, there's just really interesting ways for it to get out there. We have little uh, solar-powered MP3 players, that, excuse me, that people can use to listen to scripture. We can put it onto uh, cell phones even, and all different ways that it can get out there. So it's just really, really exciting, all the different opportunities that um, are available. So people have been asking us on this trip, uh, when do you think you'll finish the New Testament? That's a very hard question <laughs> to answer. There's so many things that we can't quite account for. Andrew will be graduating from high school in two years, and so we're hoping to start moving towards uh, going back overseas uh, sometime after he graduates, maybe start taking longer trips together, and then after a couple of years, maybe move back to finish the New Testament. So the rough answer is hopefully within five to 10 years, we would like to finish the New Testament uh, usually at the end, there's a lot more work than you think is going to be there to actually finish things up and get all the little bugs ironed out. So we're not, we're not exactly sure, but um, we just really appreciate the church being with us, praying for us. Uh, if you are not receiving our updates, please talk to us if you're interested in getting them because we regularly let people know by email how they can be praying for us and what's going on with the manga people. So we'd love to, to keep you informed. And I'd like to now close by... Uh, reading those same verses again that Eric read at the beginning, but I would like to read them from the perspective of the manga people. So think of this as the manga people speaking to you. As for other matters, brothers and sisters, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread, spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful, and he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Let's pray together. Lord God, we do thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you that you have created us in your image that you desire that we, we know you, that we experience you through your son, Jesus. Lord, it's not only a privilege to know you as Christians, but it's a privilege for Amy and I to see this happening in the life of the Manga people. Lord, it, it affirms to us, it, it reaffirms the truth of your word, that people are are hungry to know you when they, they find out that they too have been created by you, that you have offered a way to paradise through forgiveness of sins, and they're eager and hungry, hungry for that. And Lord, that is such an encouragement to our hearts. We just pray that you would bless the Manga people today, bless uh, as they read your word, as they watch things like the Jesus film, as they um, are encouraged in their faith, we pray that they would grow. We pray that they would reach out to you. And we pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, would, would bless them in these ways. Lord, please continue to go uh, before us and before them in the work of Bible translation. And we pray that you would bring uh, success, that your word would not return void. 
but people's hearts would be filled with your goodness and your truth. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.